Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle, and welcome to Chasing Legends. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. Before we get started any further, hit our subscribe button, hit the notification bell, go to our website, www.legendofsuperstitionmountains.com. All our stuff's there, shirts, coffee cups, hats and stuff. Our archives are loaded there. Thank you again for joining us on our YouTube channel. Uh, this week, I want to get right into it. Um, I'm going to do two stories, and it's going to be the wrap-up of kind of the rabbit hole for a, a little bit. And we'll have some more stuff that will trickle through, but I, I need a break, if anybody needs a break. So the first story is something everybody's more familiar with. Um, it's a story that's kind of passed around. First time I think it's published, it's out there, it's around 1992 from an author named David um, Childress. And uh, he published it in a book about lost cities in North and South America. Like I said, it's around 92, 92, and he says it was an individual named Richard Donnelly had passed in the story. Now, Childress generally is involved in Sedona-type stuff and that kind of thing, but he met Donnelly up in Sedona, and Donnelly told him about some people he knew that had told him this story, and they had discovered a place, and supposedly it interconnected somehow with Sedona. It gets a little hazy there. These individuals found a place, a cave, or an entrance to a tunnel in the Superstition Mountains. They went in and went down this very long tunnel. We're not told. You know, it, it's kind of odd in a lot of these stories. They always say it's a long tunnel. It was a, took them like an hour. It took the, it, they never give us a distance. Was it 200 yards, 500 yards? What was it? Anyways, they go to them, this tunnel, and, they, and every time they go in it, they seem to have this foreboding. They get afraid. They just get, so they kind of back out of it. So finally they get a guide, someone familiar with the mountains, who is never named. And n none of the friends or any of the people are named. So they go back with him, go in with him, they get down, and what they find at the end of the tunnel is a stairwell that goes down into the earth, um, hewn from stone and rock. So they send the guide down because they're scared to death. They won't have nothing to do with it. And the guide goes down, and he's gone for quite a while. He says it took him forever to get to the bottom. He gets to the bottom, and he comes, he comes back up, and he, he's scared to death, and he's like, we need to leave. And they're like, what did you see? He said he went into this chamber, and there were artifacts. He wasn't sure what they were. They were on the walls and in cubby holes, and there was this giant throne. And there's nothing descriptive, nothing size-wise, nothing detailed about the story, it appears, that has ever come out. Anyhow, they told him, you need to run back down there and get one of these artifacts or something to prove this. And he says, no, not on your life. And that's the end of the story. Um, they leave. It's kept a secret to this day. And blah, blah, blah. Now, there is a site in the superstitions that is similar to this that is drawn away from it. It was discovered. Most of the modern discovery um, material, and it's something we will be covering in detail. We have video footage and so forth of a place that has a very long tunnel. Um, doesn't have a giant throne, but it does have a hewn staircase in it. Now there's two such known places. One is the staircase mine, the other is known as the spiral staircase. Staircase mine was out by Bob Ward's cabin. It actually has a cement stone, step stones, and it sounds more like this story, even though it doesn't go very far. And it just winds kind of a, maybe a, even a half turn going around the corner and then it ends down in the bottom. Um, very little gold was pulled out of there. I believe Henry de Cook, Bob Ward, Don Hensley, Tom Collinborn at different times owned this, um, had uh, had the deed on it and worked it. But it's a very different. Now it's confusing because the spiral staircase is in a completely different location. It's a completely different type of thing. And it interrelates to our second story as well because it's not really a mine, has nothing to do with mining. It was tunneled possibly for ceremonial or other reasons. And Frank, like I said, when we get to that in detail, there will be video footage. You guys will love those episodes. So look forward to that stuff when we get to it because there's a lot of detail, a lot of history, a lot, of, a lot we cover on that. 
But it sounds a little like that story too, like a combination of the two. Now, Bob Ward talked about the staircase mine and he made references with once you went down, there was a wooden hatch and you open it and it went down to the underground. And he did a newspaper interview on it and there's no such thing there. Um, I, I did go in there and film and kind of like, so people would understand the difference between the two places. But at the same time, some people... Th some people honestly are confused of the two, and then other people try to fake it by using one over the other. Um, the spiral staircase is a very different thing completely, and, and, and it's still to this day a puzzle. It, it, it's, it's a conundrum unto itself. Now, that being said, the story has almost no documentation fact. Um, Childress wrote that book, 92 or so, and he wrote about 200 books. He's a Frenchman. I don't know if that means anything, but he writes books about this kind of stuff and hollow earth theory and all kinds of things like that. And so that's his kind of his forte, expert in nothing, general in everything. And he's known as um, an adventure explorer and a maverick archaeologist. So that should tell you a lot. And I have several of his books, read them. If you're looking for something kind of entertaining, amusing of why people come sometimes buy into that stuff, it's fun to read. He does stuff on the Templars and kind of the Oak Island kind of stuff and different lost civilizations. That's fine. The second story is interesting because I'd never really heard it. It involves a gentleman named Dr. Hank Craftsman. He um, had a PhD and I believe it was sociology, but he was a psychologist. Um, he had quite a career. He did a number of radio interviews, different things. He wrote one book and had one popular theory. You might have heard of it. It was the Admiral Byrd South Pole underground city type situation. But he also had something connected to the Hopi Indians. And his story is kind of as follows in a general sense. Um, he was going to NAU, Northern Arizona State University, in 1961. And he met a young man whose name was... Levi, and his last name, I think his first name was Levi, and his last name is Waltz. But his middle name is Hopi, and he meets this gentleman. They're both students, and the student who has blonde hair and blue eyes tells him, my great-great-grandmother was Hopi, and my great-grandfather was, was Dutch. He was from Holland, and his name was Jacob Waltz. And um, Craftsman was like, you mean the Dutchman? And he said, yes, the lost Dutchman. Now, I think the guy's name was Capaldi is what he calls him generally in the stories if you look that up. And Craftsman and him uh, went out and Capaldi said he was from this underground city in the Grand Canyon where the Hopi came from. And that's where he was born and raised and where he came from. And at that point, you're kind of starting to confuse the issues that it's a blonde, blue-eyed Hopi that was born in the Grand Canyon in a mysterious city. And it seems unlikely, but... We'll continue. So, Craftsman, Capalvi, or whatever his name is, takes Craftsman out to the Grand Canyon, opens like this secret passage, and they get in, and there's like some sort of escalator thing you lay on, and then it travels you like at light speed into the earth, and you come into a room, you get up, and there's a circular room with doors. And unless you have a guide like Capalvi, you would get lost or go in the wrong door and be lost to time. But he knows which door is the right door at the right time. And they find this underground city that has kind of an orb in the sky. And it's got blue skies and wonderful cities. And it's a lost civilization. And the people are all beautiful. And Christmas supposedly falls in love with a woman there. And has this romance and all this stuff. And... Then has to leave, but then he can never find the place again. Capalvi disappears or something happens and all this disappears. In the meantime instance, Capalvi also tells him his great-great-grandfather is Jacob Waltz. And he tells him the Waltz story. And the Waltz story is that Jacob Waltz married a Hopi woman. The Hopi woman had been taken out of her clan and married into a Pima clan. And she married Waltz in 1875 and her name is like Fury or Fire Eyes or something. And she was 16 years old. She married 65-year-old Waltz. And they are engaged. Well, then a problem happens. They're living in the Pima village. And we're, remember, we're telling a story here, not trying to argue the documentation, which we will. But they're living in the Pima village, and the Pimas have to deliver salt to the underground people. 
and they can't and they're fearful, but they need someone to do it. And Walt has no fear of this and he's a white guy. So they know he can pass through this secret kind of portal entrance to go in there and deliver the salt. For delivering the salt, the Pimas give Walt's bags of gold, possibly ore. And Walt takes this ore and he's that's his lost Dutch of mine. So Craftsman said, that's the lost Dutchman of mine story. And Capaldi tells him, yes, that's what the story is actually is, is Walt's received the gold from the Pimas from wherever they got it, which we're not told. Um, Craftsman said this was going to be in his new book. He was going to release a book with all the information concerning the Hopis and Capaldi and the Grand Canyon and all the details of this stuff in a huge detail. This is from an interview Unfortunately, Cressman died, and the manuscript for that is probably held within the family or whatever happened, but it was never released. I've looked and looked, and I contacted a few people to see if anyone had ever even read the full manuscript, but it appears that before the book was published, he died, and the manuscript is lost. It'd be interesting to see if there was any documentation or detail. Now we know 1875, Waltz is living in Phoenix, and there's documentation of living there, not at a Pima village. We know, according to the details in the story, what details there are. There's no absolute truth to it. It is interesting, because if you take the combination of the two stories and you take the spiral staircase, there is a two, three hundred foot tunnel. There is a, there, it leads to the end, underground, to a spiral um, tunnel that leads down at least 125 feet. There were certain seals placed in it. Um, the Hopi did believe they came from the underground and the Pimas were in the area and the, the generally it was Hohokam um, ruins in that area though. So it is kind of puzzling because when you take that particular site and these odd stories. Now the site was known in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. So these stories could have been derived from people who have heard from some of the guys out there prospecting and working in those areas. And then they were reimagined for this stuff. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these guys, when they write the books, they're very influenced by some of the same material that I read when I was growing up. I was a great lover of H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard. Yeah, I liked Poe and other stuff, but I really liked H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard. Robert E. Howard, because Lovecraft is probably far more well-known, but Robert E. Howard was known for the Conan books, Conan of Sumeria. And I was a big fan of his writings and stuff. It was usually the weird tales and that type of stuff, magazines, amazing stories type things that stuff was published in, which is kind of like dime Western novels. It's not necessarily anything's true. It's just fictional stories written by these people. And sometimes Howard, who was friends with Lovecraft, would allow Lovecraft stuff to influence into his, and, the, and they do that stuff. And a lot of these guys today take what I remember as fiction, reading these short stories by these authors, and they create these complete things of like Lemuria and the hidden civilization and all. But I remember those from that type of stuff. Jules Verne wrote stuff like that. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote stuff like that. And it was all kind of for fun and fanciful. And I was a big fan of it as a kid. So unfortunately, when I look at a lot of this stuff today, it starts hearkening back to stories I read as a kid, various things. In fact, recently I wanted to get in. I know there's a box where I have all my Robert E. Howard stuff, which I haven't probably read in 40, 50 years. Now, I will not say the person's name, but there was someone I was with many, many, many years ago. And she was looking at my bookshelf, and then she found this pile of books. And she found I read Robert E. Howard and that type of stuff in Lovecraft. And she was very kind of snotty about it. Like, I can't believe you read this type of stuff. And you're into Freud, and you're into Jung, and all this other stuff. And yet, you'll read this? And I was like, you don't understand how good it is. And those Pulp Fiction stuff, that stuff was great stuff to read. It was fun stuff. Um... I don't know what to tell anybody. It's, it's, it's fun literature, and sometimes you have to have fun. The problem, the aspect is, when I read it, I understood it was fictional. It was very cool and very good. Today, everybody takes it so serious all the time. So there you go. Um, Dr. Hank Craftsman, unfortunately, he passed away. Would have loved to met the guy, or I'll have that book come out, because I would have liked to know more. I dug as much as I could, and there's more details of things, but nothing really about that Walt story. He seemed to tell it in interviews. Yeah, you're going to have to wait for the book. When you read this in the book, it's going to blow your mind, and then it's gone. Um, I couldn't find any other material concerning that, which is disappointing because... 
it'd be nice to follow some of that up. And the other story with David Childress, Hatcher Childress, or whatever his name is, he's got so many books, but they kind of run these odd different themes, and I'm not sure how much he really documents and fact checks himself. Um, he kind of falls down the Eric Van Daniken kind of like wormhole there with stuff. And generally kind of seems to assume or look for the exciting thing. They, they were reality television, Chariots of the Gods, that type of That was reality television before reality television, really, in some senses. That was, that was the kind of the book form of it. But these stories are interesting. And like I said, one I had never heard of, the other one I'd been familiar with. But I wanted to do some digging and contact. I could not f contact or get anyone to talk to me from either side. I do reach out to these people occasionally that have written these books or kind of where I think I find an early story. If they're alive, I try to reach out a little to see if they have a statement or something on it. Generally, nobody wants to talk to me because I'm not being negative. I'm just like, okay, what were your sources? Who were these people? Do you, what did you think of the story when you were told the story? Was it just good to put it in there or use it in interviews and stuff? Was it a good marketing tool or what was it? And um, nobody ever wants to talk to me, so I don't even get that far. So there you go, the last of the rabbit hole. Um, if you go out there and you find yourself a tunnel and go down, there's a giant throne, grab an artifact or something. Because, you know, it's just like anything else. If you grab out and you bring out a real piece of gold or a real gold bar or that, it does make a difference. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us again. This is our second episode into the new year. We got our first live done, which was kind of a bit of fun, even though Trevor dropped the ball on our intro and stuff. And hopefully this next week he'll have that prepared. Um, not sure how smoothly things will go after this next Monday for things out of beyond our control, but hopefully we will continue to keep on speed with Mondays and Fridays and everything. If there is a problem moving in the future beyond next Monday, we will let everybody know and we'll make sure it's out there so everybody kind of knows the concerns and what kind of some of those problems are. But there shouldn't be, we're not expecting but to proceed it so people understand. So maybe we might have to run some other things or something. So there you go. David Hatcher Childress. You can pick up his books, look up the, you know, the bibliography on him. Um, Craftsman, I think there was really just the one book. He probably did publish some other things. Check his stuff out. Hey, hollow earthers, just like flat earthers. You could argue to you're blue in the face. They're not going to hear any different. All right. So there you go. Thank you for joining us. Please hit our website, hit everything. Hope everybody's having a wonderful new year and a wonderful week still. All right. Till the next time, remember, I'm Wayne Tuttle. You're not. And this was Chasing Legends.